Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Fellas and girls, picture yourself dog sledding hour after hour on the Yukon Trail, like Sergeant Preston you'd soon find out that real stamina calls for a nourishing He-Man breakfast. So remember, every time you eat a heaping bowlful of delicious, crisp, Quaker-puffed wheat or Quaker-puffed rice, you get extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. For a nourishing treat, eat Quaker-puffed rice and Quaker-puffed wheat. Jeremy Ward operated a freight line between Whitehorse and Dawson. A sturdy building in Whitehorse served as both a home and office. Old Hank, a retired dog driver, was Jeremy's closest friend and frequently came into town to visit Jeremy and Jeremy's grandson, an orphan named Billy. Go on, Hank. Tell me some more. <laughs> All right, Billy, now, wide-eyed, Billy, and old now, Hank uh, sat at a front uh, window. Hank was in the midst of one of his fabulous now. stories of the trail. Uh, while Jeremy worked on records Where in an inner room. Was I? The wolves were coming at you on the tree. Uh, yes, sir, ten of them. Well, there I was. Uh, <coughs> oh, and Grandpa's interrupted again. Yes, he's no team coming this way. Jeremy, I told you I'd let you know when I saw that messenger. What makes him so all fired important? I declare I never saw him so squirmy. Well, Hank, I didn't want to say anything before, but I can tell you now. That messenger is coming from Diamond Bill Davis. From Diamond Bill, you say? Yes, he's a collector of jewels. <laughs> he thinks he's like Diamond Jim Brady. He brought a fortune in diamonds with him when he came from the States. There was a piece of the paper about Diamond Bill. Said he was going to ship a million dollars worth of diamonds back to the States. He's going to sell them there. It was a fool idea to put that in the paper. It's an invite to every crook in the Yukon. Is he really sending down a million dollars worth of diamonds? Well, that's stretching it, but he's sending a lot. People around here don't have much use for fancy jewelry and diamonds. He'll get a better price for the jewels in the States. Uh, Savvy, are you going to handle the shipment? I'm to see that the diamonds get as far as Dawson. After that, it's up to the steamship company. Uh, those diamonds would make a big haul for crook. And that's why the shipping plans are mighty secret. No one knows how the diamonds are going to be sent to Dawson or when, not even me. You don't know? Nope. The man I'm expecting from Mr. Davis will bring word about when and how we handle the cargo. Now, you keep watching out that window, Hank. Let me know as soon as you see a man with a dog team. I huh? told you I'd let you know. We're watching, Grandpa. Now go on back to your office and let me get on with the story I was telling Billy. All right, but just keep watching, that all. I hope he doesn't interrupt us again. Now, uh, where was I at? We were out of ammunition, and the wolves were closing in. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Twenty wolves. Ten wolves. Oh, ten, huh? Well, there I was, with ten hungry wolves showing their fangs. I expected them to finish me off most any second. Then I heard a man yelling in the distance. Get him, King, he yelled. Get him, King. Just like that. Well, then what? Well, then I saw a great big dog streaking across the snow... He was coming like grease lightning. It was Yukon King. Sure enough. And he lit into that pack of wolves, fighting, tearing, and dashing, and leaping. <laughs> I tell you, I never seen the like of it. Then Sergeant Preston with his dog team comes into view. He's coming fast and shooting with a gun in each hand. Then those wolves, they just skedaddled. They got out of there in a hurry. Oh, golly. 
Oh, Hank. Hank, look. Look outside. Huh? There comes a man with a dog team. Maybe that's the messenger Grandpa's waiting for. But sure enough. Jeremy! Jeremy! Here, here comes the messenger, the man you're waiting for. Good, good. By golly, I'm glad he's here at last. Jeremy Waterhound? Yeah, that's my name. Hey, come in here. Come in fast. I'm waiting for you. I have a letter for you. I know what you have. I had a hard time on the trail. I was delayed a little bit. That's all right. You're here at last. Well, you didn't tie your dog. Now, they'll stay where they are. They're all right for a minute or so. Where's that letter? Yeah, get the letter right here, Mr. Ward. Yeah, bring it in my office. Hank, you'd better come along. All eh? right, Jeremy. Mr., uh... Do you mind if I go out and look at your dog? Oh, I know. No, go ahead, sir. Uh, Billy, if you're going out, see that you pull on your pocket. Oh, yes, sir. Now, let's get back to my office. I'm downright anxious to see what that letter has to say. Well, I figured it's important. The messenger and old Hank followed Jeremy into the office. Billy hurriedly pulled on his parka and then went outside to admire the messenger's dog team. The boy was particularly impressed by a strong, powerful lead dog. He bent and stroked the animal's ears. The ten-year-old boy admired the other dogs and then moved to a position behind the sled and stood on the runners. Golly, now I feel just like Sergeant Preston. The game of make-believe appealed to Billy. He fancied himself as a brave Mountie who maintained law and order in the Yukon Territory. He whispered, Come on, King. Come on, King. On you, Huskies. Then, growing more bold, he picked up the whip and in a louder voice said, On, King. On you, Huskies. <laughs> The dogs became more alert. The leader turned back and looked inquiringly at Billy as he waved the whip and stood on the runners. Bolder then, the boy raised his voice and shouted as he cracked the whip. On King! On you, Husky! Oh, 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 wait! Wait! Oh, dear, my foot's caught. Wait a minute! Hold on! Hold on there! The leader of the dogs took off at a fast clip and the others pulled their weight. Billy tried to jump off the sled, but found that the lacing of his boots had become tangled with the jagged saw teeth of the brake. He was caught. He dropped the whip and clung desperately to the handle so he would not be thrown and dragged. Grandpa! Grandpa, help me! Help me! Stop the door! His cries brought Jeremy to the door with Hank and the messenger close behind. It's your dog team and your sled. They're running away with Billy. Come back here! Come back! Come back here! Come back, you Ah, uh, They can't hear you now. They've gone too far. We've got to get after it. Yeah, but how? We can't travel on foot. We've got to find another team. By the time we get dogs lined up and hitched to a sled, those critters will have Billy halfway to the border. I'll see what I can find. Billy was gripped by a paralyzing fear. The dogs soon left the regular trail and dashed across uneven ground. Billy clung desperately to the back of the pitching, swaying sled, and then his hands became numb. He was thrown off the sled and landed in the thicket by the trail. His head struck the side of a huge rock. For a time, he lay unconscious. He recovered in the shelter of the rock and underbrush. But he was only half conscious when he heard the voices of two men from the opposite side of the massive boulder. Can you open that old man's safe? Jeremy Ward? <laughs> That's easy. Well, then we've got nothing to worry about. Just open her up and get that letter. Yeah, but Baxter, are you sure Ward will have the letter in his safe? Well, of course he will, Slick. Where else would he keep it? But when Ward finds the letter's gone, he'll think back to the people who worked for him who knew about his safe, and he'll think of me. I'll be the first one suspected. No, he won't. Besides that, when he finds the letter's gone, he'll know there's a plan afoot to steal the Davis Diamonds. Then the shipping plans will be changed. I figured all that out, Slick. Yeah? When you steal a letter, take whatever cash is in the safe. We'll use that to frame someone for the robbery. Well, let's hear some more. Who do we frame? My old Hank. But he's Jeremy Ward's best friend. Yeah, knows all about Ward's business. He probably knows how to open Ward's safe. Oh, I see. Now, Hank lives in a shack between here and town. We'll make a copy of the plans for shipping the diamonds, then we'll hide the letter in the stolen cash in Hank's house. Then what? As soon as we have the stuff planted in Hank's house, we'll find some way to get Hank out of the way. So it'll look like an accident. After he's dead, the constable will go through his possessions. Then they'll find the stolen cash and the letter. You think Ward will believe his old friend turned crook? What else can he believe? He'll figure no one else has seen the shipping plans with the diamonds. So there'll be no reason to change the plans. Oh, Baxter, that downright smart planning. Once we know how and when the diamonds are to be sent to Dawson... We can figure a way to get them. This will be the biggest jewel robbery the Yukon's ever seen. We'd better start for town now. It'll be dark when we get there. Hey, wait. If anyone sees me in town, they're... Like they'll put two and two together. Remember that I work for Jeremy, that I might know how to open his safe. 
It won't be hard for you to keep out of sight. We'd stay away from the regular trail. Now, let's get started. Billy's head hurt terribly, but he'd been afraid to stir for fear the man who plotted against his grandpa would discover him on the opposite side of the big rock. He sobbed softly as the two men moved away. Oh, oh, crooks. Those dirty, scheming crooks. When he tried to stand, Billy felt as though the world were spinning. His head throbbed where he had struck it on the rock. And then he seemed to see a million lights. An instant later, he slumped to the ground, unconscious for a second time. By the time old Hank, Jeremy, and Dave, the messenger, had found a sled and snowshoes to go in search of Billy, snow had began to fall. This and a high wind soon wiped out the trail. Then darkness came, but the three kept on. In the meantime, Billy regained consciousness on a bunk inside a cabin. He looked up, and by the light of an oil lamp, saw a man whose face wore a look of anxiety. The man wore a parka that concealed his uniform. Billy didn't know that he was Sergeant Preston. You, you must be one. Well, take it easy, son. Don't try to talk until you feel stronger. What? Where am I? In a cabin. I found you in the woods and brought you here. You've been unconscious for a long time. You're one of them. What? I heard you talking. You're planning to rob the safe and kill old Hank. Oh, steady, son. Which one are you, Slick or Baxter? Slick? Baxter? Well, I'm neither one of those men. You are. You must be or you wouldn't have found me here. Now I suppose you're going to kill me, too. I found you unconscious beside a big rock. Put you on my sled and brought you here. You had a nasty bump on the head. Now tell me, son, what's your name? My name? I... Oh. Easy. Oh, unconscious again. Boy's badly hurt. wonder who he is and what he heard. A robbery and a murder. We'll continue our adventure... In just a moment. <laughs> Say, what's up? Who's on the warpath? No oh, warpath. Me, Barry Hatchet. <laughs> well, what goes on? Me, now, Big Chief. Make celebration. Oh, I see. Congratulations are in order. And say, I have something I'd like to give you because it's just what a big chief ought to have for breakfast every morning. Must be special big for big chief. Oh, it is. Everything about Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice is big. Take a look at the big red and blue packages. Ah, me like colors, red and blue. And did you ever see any cereal so deliciously big and crisp as Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice? Mm. Plenty big. Yes, those choice premium kernels of wheat and rice shot from guns are actually exploded up to eight times normal size. Big chief, like them big. And what a big eating treat, too. They're shot from guns to make them crisp and tender, bigger and better tasting. There's bang-up nut-like flavor in every big, luscious mouthful. Me want heap big bowlful now. Coming up, big chief. Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice are ready to serve. We just top them with milk or cream and fruit, and then go to it. And as all you fellas and girls know, you can always have those second and third helpings, because Quaker popped wheat and rice are so good for you. They both furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Don't miss out a single morning. For a heap big treat... Eat Quaker popped rice and Quaker popped wheat. Shot from gun. Now to continue. Jeremy Ward was assisted by his old friend Hank and a messenger named Dave in searching for his 10-year-old grandson who had been carried off on a sled by a runaway dog team. The three beat through the wind and snow in the Yukon night, not knowing that Sergeant Preston had found Billy and that at that very moment, the boy lay unconscious in old Hank's cabin. Meanwhile, Slick and Baxter crept toward the rear of the building that served Jeremy Ward as a home and an office. There's no lights in there, Slick. 
Think the old man's going to bed this early? Not unless he changed his way of living. More likely is it one of the cafes down the street. <laughs> yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> Just like old Ward never locks the door. This is going to be a pushover. Better close the door. The safe is right over here. Keep close to me. I've got a hunk of candle here. I'll light it. If we're not disturbed, we can copy the letter right here. Then take the original and the cash to old Hank's cabin. In the meantime, in old Hank's cabin, Sergeant Preston had become increasingly concerned by the prolonged unconsciousness of Billy. Finally, he opened the door and called. King, come in here, boy. That's it, fella. <laughs> King, I think we'd better not try to move the boy. He may have a fractured skull. <laughs> I'm going to write a note, King, and you're going to take it into town. I'll tie it to your collar in plain sight, and whoever sees it will take it to the doctor. You'll bring him here, boy. There. Now hold still, fella. I'll just fasten this to your collar. I hope you know what I'm talking about, King. Town. Understand? Town. All right, boy. Get going, King, to town. Good boy. He knew what I meant. Great dog, Yukon King, racing toward town, passed two men headed in the opposite direction, but he paid no attention to them. He was intent on carrying out his master's orders. The men were Slick and Baxter. They were on their way to old Hank's cabin, and they carried a sum of money from Jeremy Ward's safe, also a letter they had carefully copied by candlelight. In the dim light, they could see a Parker-covered figure and dogs outside the cabin. It looks like old Hank's got himself a team of dogs. Yeah, likewise a sled. Yeah, it seems to be staking them out for the night. Well, that takes care of one thing I was worried about. Yeah, what's that? I was afraid Hank might have an alibi. It wouldn't do to try to frame him for something that happened this evening if he was spending the time with Jeremy Ward. <laughs> we needn't worry about that now. There he goes inside. Should we stay back until he puts out the light? Go and jump him now. I don't hanker to waste any time. We'll go and jump him now. Sergeant Preston had been outside attending to the dogs. Before he removed his parka, he crossed the dimly lit room and bent over the bunk to examine the boy. He found Billy's pulse more regular and his breathing more natural. Then Billy's eyelids fluttered and his lips moved slowly. Sergeant Preston bent low, straining to catch any word the boy might utter. He was so intent that he didn't hear the barely perceptible sound of the door opening. When he noticed a draft of wind, he started to turn. Then the door flew wide and two men leaped across the room. Get him, Slick, right! Oh. The barrel of Slick's gun came down on Sergeant Preston's head with stunning force. Yeah, that did it. Hey, Baxter, look. That's not old Hank. Huh? Sure not. I'll get this park open. We'll see who it is. And look there. There's a kid on the bunk. You sure this is the right cabin? You sure Hank hasn't moved? Great Scott. Huh? Look. Look what's beneath the parka. A red coat. Baxter, it's a Mountie. And look who it is. Sergeant Preston. This is a fine kettle of fish. Now what do we do? I'll see if he's alive. I didn't hit him hard enough to kill. Besides, the hood of the parka took up some of the blow. He's alive, all right. Baxter, what's he doing here? And who's that kid on the bunk? How do I know? The point is, a Mountie is here, and we slugged him. How are we going to account for that? I don't know. But we better tie him before he comes to. Yeah, well, there's some rope. I'll cut off a hunk. After that crack I gave him, he'll be out for a long time. But I'll tie his wrists together just the same. Hey, close that door. Right. Now here's the rope. Leave him face up so we can see if he comes to. Be sure you take his gun. I'll see about the kid on the bunk. What's the matter with him, Baxter? Is he sleeping? No, he's awake and looking at us. Get away from me, you crook. Who is this kid? Do you know Slick? I think he's Ward's grandson. I heard some talk about him before I got fired. His folks died in the States, and he was to come up and live with Jeremy. Is that right, kid? Yes, that's right. And if you think you can get away with robbing my grandfather and murdering old Hank... What's that? I heard you talking about it. I know what you're going to do. What do you mean you heard us talking about it? How could you overhear I it? did hear you. I was right behind the rock. You must be mistaken, kid. Maybe you misunderstood something that was said. I'm not mistaken. You want to steal some diamonds, but you had to find out how they were being shipped. 
You had to get a letter from Grandpa safe so you'd know where to steal them. Well, you don't say. You were going to steal some money, and you said you'd plant it in Hank's house so Hank would get the blame. What are you doing here in Hank's house? Is this Hank's? I said, what are you doing here? I don't know how I got here. I guess that man brought me. Sergeant Preston? Oh, golly. Is that Sergeant Preston? Listen, Baxter, we've got no choice. The kid knows too much. I'm going to get... Get back there in that bunk. Oh. You're not getting up. Oh, this blows all our plans sky high. Did you get that Mountie's hands tied tight? Sure thing. Here's a hunk of rope. You better tie the kid while we decide what we're going to do. It's a good idea. No, no. You shut up. <laughs> Sergeant Preston had regained his senses to find that his hands were tied together at the wrists. He had remained limp with his eyes closed, feigning unconsciousness in the hope of learning the reason for the sudden attack. His hopes had been fulfilled when Billy told the outlaws what he knew. Now he struggled at the rope, straining, trying to get his hands free. He raged inwardly at the thought of Billy being roughly handled and tied in his injured condition. His anger added to his strength, but not enough to stretch or break the stout cord. I thought it over, Slick. The Monty and the kid have got to die. Killing a Monty is bad business. Preston came here by his own accord. He's the one who lit that candle. The shack is dry enough to burn like tinder. All we've got to do is drop the candle in the box of kindling wood. No! No, you can't do that! <laughs> do you think you can stab us? You hang! You hang if you do anything like that! We'll take that chance. Put the Monty on that other bunk so it'll look like he was sleeping when the place caught fire. You take his feet, and I'll take his shoulders. Maybe after the fire is out, there'll be evidence to show that his hands were tied. What'll we do about that? I'll take care of that. As soon as the fire is going, we'll give him an extra wrap on the head. Take the rope off his wrist. What about the kid? The same. Come on, get his feet. Yeah. Uh. Sergeant Preston remained limp as he was lifted off the floor, but his mind was racing madly. He knew that any break he made would have to come before the next blow on the head sent him back into oblivion. Put him right on his back so he can cut the rope that holds his wrist. Right. Slick was bent over the foot of the bunk as he lowered the mounty. Then Preston acted with lightning speed. He drew up his knees and shot both feet out. His boot heels cracked against Slick's chin with stunning force. Slick's head snapped back. He staggered and fell. Baxter was wide-eyed with surprise. Before he could go for his gun, Preston rolled off the bunk, landing cat-like on his hands and feet. He leaped from the crouch and charged. The Mountie's head caught Baxter in the pit of his stomach and drove him back against the wall. Then Preston brought up both fists tied together. The uppercut was short but full of force. Take it! Uh, That's it, Sergeant Preston. You've got him. I'll kill you for that. You'd have killed me for less if you could. Baxter brought up his gun. The Mountie's hands came down with a chopping stroke to the wrist. Oh! Slick had been stunned, but momentarily, when he showed signs of recovery and began fumbling for his gun, Billy shrilled a warning. Behind you, the other one. Preston dropped to the floor, scooped up Baxter's gun, and fired. Oh. The bullet caught oh. Slick in the wrist just oh. as his gun cleared the holster. That does it. Hold it, Baxter. Freeze. I'm hit. You shot me. Are you surprised? Stand right where you are, Baxter, and keep your hands above the shoulders. You were playing possum. It's a good game, properly played. I'm a hurt, I tell you. Not seriously. I hear a dog. That's King, Billy. I sent him for a doctor. Get over there, Baxter, beside your friend. Come on in. Come on in, all of you. Uh, Billy. Oh, great day, Shunny. You're all right. What's going on here? Who are these critters? A couple of crooks who planned to rob your safe and put the blame on Hank. Doctor, take a look at Billy. He had a hard rap on the head. Yes, sir. Well, he's tied. They're both tied. We're lucky to be alive. Preston and Billy were quickly untied. Doc looked at the boy and found that his injury was not serious, while Preston searched Slick and Baxter. He found money from Jeremy Ward's safe, also the secret shipping orders and a copy of those orders. Meanwhile, Jeremy told about the runaway dog team and the search for Billy. After beating around in the night for some time, we decided to go back to town and get more men to help search. We were there when we saw your big dog race into town with a note tied to his collar. We figured the boy might be Billy, so we came here. Then you didn't even know your safe had been robbed. No, with this letter and the cash who approves it. Sleek, I told you to stay out of town. Now, by thunder, you can go to jail. It was all Baxter's idea. Why are you... You'll both go to jail. And about the diamond, Sergeant Preston. According to this letter, they're supposed to arrive tomorrow. The messenger is going to give them to me and help me plan on getting them to Dawson. That's right, Jeremy. I was on my way to your place when I found Billy. 
You? Yes, I have the diamonds. They're in a belt under my shirt. What's that? The Maori had them. You were closer to them than you thought. Of all our rotten luck. <laughs> yes, King, we'll take these men to town and put them in jail, boy. Well, Billy, I've told you plenty of stories about Sergeant Preston and Yukon King. <laughs> now, Hank, I guess I can tell a story. Can I, Sergeant Preston? <laughs> Indeed you can, Billy. <laughs> And be sure to tell how foolish and dejected outlaws look when they come to the end of the trail and their case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Say, fellas and girls, are you building the exciting Yukon Trail at your house? Well, hurry. The Sergeant Preston Yukon Trail cutout models come with eight different packages of delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. You'll want the complete set, so you'll have all 59 of these larger, easier to build models. Just go to your grocers. There's no waiting, no box stops, no coupons. It's thrilling to have models of the very places that you hear about in these danger-packed adventures of Sergeant Preston and King. You get models of the Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters, a lumber camp, mining camp, the White Horse Hotel, general store, and jail. You get dog sleds, teams of huskies, all kinds of Yukon animals. You get the Yukon Queen Riverboat with a paddle that actually turns. These models are so amazingly different you even get scenery and the interiors of buildings. So build your complete Yukon Trail from Whitehorse to Dawson City right away. Get them at your grocer's now. They come only with the big red and blue packages of delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Yes, the original crisp, fresh, shot from gun cereal that is never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the man who fled. A fugitive from justice who had come to the Yukon under a false identity. A sinister blackmailer who met a well-deserved fate and a name scrawled on the wall. Those were the clues I had to work with. They led me to the solution of a murder case, but when I found the guilty party, I also found myself facing a loaded six-gun. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, and directed by Fred Flowerday. Today's adventure was written by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Remember, for delicious hot breakfasts, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs> <laughs>